All right. Well, good good afternoon and uh, welcome. By, na by way of introduction, my name is Sean Bice. I lead a number of the non-relational uh, services in AWS. So uh, over the course of this hour, um, we'll provide some more updates uh, about uh, what you heard from Andy this morning. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Dynamo, uh, Elasticsearch, Elasticash, uh, of course, Neptune. Um, at the very end of the talk, we have pointers to detailed sessions for all these things. So, um, and then of course, uh, we'll try to make this fun um, in a sense of, instead of me standing here for a whole hour, um, uh, Andy Gutmans will join me uh, to talk about Elasticsearch, Elasticash, and Neptune. Tony Petrosian will join me to talk about uh, Dynamo, uh, and then uh, Joseph Idzarek will join me. Uh, he's going to put this really cool demo together, so we're going to put you on the spot today uh, to show, you know, just a live demo of stitching together a bunch of database services. So with that, um, before we get into that, um, I get asked a question, or for those of us that have been doing database stuff um, for a while, um, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, if I was standing here, we'd be talking about Relational databases only, and I'd probably be talking about five of them. That's it. Uh, but the world has changed. Um, and one of the questions I get from folks, um, specific, well, business uh, leaders as well as um, developers is, you know, how do I think about all these different database choices? And, you know, if I were to sort of come up with one word uh, to help people sort of start to reason or think about these different database choices. It's, it's this noun uh, purpose. And uh, it's really this notion of purpose or purpose built uh, is foundational to you know, many databases that are being built today and tomorrow, but it's really about from a developer's perspective, uh, picking the right tool for the right job. And you know, what we've learned from history is applications um, really drive the requirements of what a database should do as opposed to the other way around. And the reality is the, the characteristics of applications have changed uh, quite a bit. And I'll show you a couple slides here in a minute, just simple framing slides and, and some of these different characteristics. You know, but um, the reality is uh, developers today are using um, relational models. It's been around since the 70s, not gonna go away. That's great if you need referential integrity. But developers are also using new data models like key value, uh, time series, graph, uh, and document. Um, and they're using these databases for very specific purposes. What I usually hear from developers is they don't wanna tra trade off scale performance or programmability, um, you know, in the spirit of having a, like a one-size-fits-all system. Uh, it's pretty easy to overburden any database. Um, so let me, you know, let me sort of, I'm going to show you this analogy uh, I share with folks, um, just to use an analogy to frame up how to think about different databases. So sort of over the page in the lower left corner, a pickup truck is a great utility. I can move dirt with it, I can pull a trailer, I can put passengers in it, and what it does, it does very well. But if we were gonna build an airport and we needed to move thousands of tons of dirt, um, we would go employ uh, an earth mover to do that because an earth mover's purpose is to move thousands of tons of dirt efficiently. Um, we could elect to use a pickup truck to move thousands of tons of dirt, but we'd probably overburden that pickup truck in a hurry. Um, now, likewise, if I were gonna deliver groceries, uh, like in Amazon uh, Prime, if you think about it, a delivery truck has some really, you know, it looks boxy, but that design and its purpose is, is, is very specialized. It's designed to go through city streets, make tight turns, be efficient, that door is open for a reason so drivers can go in and out, easy access to put something at a doorstep, get back in and off they go. You know, we could use a earth mover to deliver groceries, but imagine that thing, you know, wheeling through your neighborhood and the guy jumps out just to give you a gallon of milk. It's kind of ridiculous in that sense. And then finally, if we were gonna move cargo, lots of cargo uh, across the country, we'd probably employ an 18 wheeler whose purpose is to move lots of cargo. Uh, and in this particular example, these trailers are designed to a very certain specification. So when they back a trailer in and open the doors, there's no adjustment. Handlers literally come right in, 
they pull all that cargo off and off they go. So this is just one analogy uh, to think about things that actually uh, have a purpose. You know, and if I were standing here today to say, hey, Amazon has you know, one database um, to do everything, it would sort of be like me maybe saying, you know, there's one vehicle and it's a utility, it's an earth mover, it's a delivery truck and a cargo uh, all in one. So that, I don't know that that's really real. Now, let's take a look at app characteristics. So um, probably one of the more important things that I've learned over the past few years are these next two slides. It really helps me understand sort of different databases that are being designed. So for those of us that have been building apps, you know, pre-cloud era, think back to the 90s. Um, it was pretty uh, common, Eli, this would not be you, by the way, but this would be pretty common for, you could walk into an enterprise, somebody would build an HR app, a CRM app, whatever. It was usually a single stack. All these applications were typically being built against a relational system. Users were measured in order of hundreds to thousands. Uh, data volume was typically gigabytes. Uh, locality usually was, you know, access was within a headquarters or division. Um, performance was often measured in seconds. And if you heard about an app that did tens of thousands requests per second back then, that would be a big deal. Um, scale was pretty much one way, scale up. The economics where you pay for everything up front, developer access was something, if you were lucky, you could get access to this in a day, but it was often weeks or months. Now what's changed? Um, this has changed. So the characteristics of cloud applications are very different. And ultimately these app characteristics drive different types of databases. Uh, what do I mean by cloud app? Netflix, uh, Tinder, Expedia. These apps can have millions of users in an instant. And you could have a million users an uh, uh, hour one and four million users an hour three. It's, it's, it can be all over the place. Um, data volumes can be terabytes to petabytes to exabytes. Uh, the interesting thing here is locality now is global. You know, if you, you heard in the keynote this morning, Expedia has is a massively scaled app with globally dispersed users. They literally have users all over the world uh, using that system. Uh, here's a nice one. Performance is measured in milliseconds and microseconds. And for those of us that have built an ad tech app, you know the diff a, a microsecond could be the difference between winning and losing a bid. And then scale is up and out and in. Um, you know, it's always easier if you're going to build something to scale it out. It's typically harder to make it go in. You know, a nice thing here, like with Elasticash, Redis, we just announced the ability um, for cluster resizing such that you can um, scale a cluster out. And for example, if you're doing a leaderboard, you launched a really popular game, like the ones that are coming out now. You had tons of users accessing that game. Great. You can scale out a Redis cluster online. Uh, nothing comes offline. And then, of course, as those users eventually get through the surge of the game, you want to be able to scale that back in while keeping the system online. So it's a really cool feature that the Redis team just shipped last week. And then my favorite thing here um, is really developer access is almost instant. You know, so as a Neptune database comes available, it's a fully managed API. It's instantly available to you. Uh, the same thing with... Um, Elasticash or Redis, developers don't sit around. And we often find developers that are building these cloud apps, they're not using one system, they're actually using multiple databases uh, in a single app to actually solve different aspects of it. So over this page, I'm trying to simplify just how to think about the characteristics of these different models. Um, this is a hard part of database stuff. We could pick any one of these topics and be here all day. But I'll just kind of do a quick flyby just to plant some seeds of thought and how to think about this. Um, so if you and I were building an app and we were selling, let's say it was a, like an Expedia, and uh, we had uh, inventory for seats, well, we would never want to put ourselves in a position where we sold something we didn't have. So in that particular case, we might, we might uh, model our inventory uh, in using a relational model because of the referential integrity, the consistency, that would be a pretty natural and normal thing to do. 
Uh, if we were allowing people to actually shop for flights, and uh, flight, we know flight uh, prices change, the routes don't change, but the prices change pretty consistently. Um, and we, we wanted to basically ensure, you know, the requirement here was super high throughput, but we wanted to guarantee sort of, you know, single digit millisecond latency um, so that regardless if we had a million or 500 or 2 million users, everybody had a consistent experience, we might use key value. Uh, for that part of the app. Um, and if I were, let's say for example, um, I don't know, if you've ever shopped for lodging, and typically at least, I remember with my family, we went to Mexico and I hadn't been there in a while, what did I do? I looked at what other people had said about places to stay, talked to my wife about it, and that's how we decided where we went. But wouldn't it be awesome if the next time I was going on a trip like that, if I could see recommendations from my friends from where they stayed, that would be super impactful um, and maybe much more engaging. And that's where a graph database could really come in and shine. Now, let me show you one example on the left of, of using a database for its purpose, like graph on the right-hand side, and then trying to use a database to do something that it wasn't naturally designed for on the left-hand side, relational. So if we think about highly connected data, um, this would be the scenario. So imagine if we built an HR app together. And uh, the question that we wanted to answer was a really high performing individual, call it top one, 2% talent, um, this person just abruptly left. And we thought, uh oh, uh, that's not good. We need to go re-recruit um, all the people that Jessica Smith worked with. Now, if I were gonna ask a question like that of a traditional relational system, the way we might think about that data is, you know, there could be an employees table, uh, departments, okay, what departments has Jessica Smith worked in? What products has Jessica worked on? Um, what skill sets, uh, et cetera. And I'd start writing a pretty complex query. I might be joining data across the system. I might say, oh, well, the people I really want to go re-recruit are top talent like her, so maybe I have to go join some data from uh, an annual review system, and you guys get the picture. It just, it can be complex, and it's a runtime event. Uh, on the right-hand side, if I were to model uh, employees with skills, with product, all of these relationships are built right in. And the reality is, when you write a query to traverse all these edges and nodes, you can get back a result set uh, almost instantly. So that's kind of just a very simple way to think about um, using, when you use something for its purpose, you get scale, you get performance, and you get full programmability. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and bring, um, actually, well, let me just give us a pointer. I'll bring Joseph up here to show us a demo. I'm not gonna go through this whole slide, I'll let you guys take pictures of it, but, um, the reality is we've got a pretty awesome portfolio of building blocks. Uh, we like to believe every database up there uh, has a purpose uh, and it's there for you. It's, all these are fully managed, fully managed APIs. And as you think about building your next generation apps with different characteristics, you know, we wanna make sure we have the right building blocks for you. What we're gonna do now is focus on the very center, the non-relational databases, and kinda, you know, give you, Joseph's gonna come join us here, and you know, let's go ahead and see what it's like sort of constructing an app and using these different database services to, to solve different problems within an application. That sound good? All right. Joseph, you ready? Yep. A few weeks ago, I walked into Sean's office and he had a picture of a calculator on his monitor. And I had asked, boss, why are you buying a calculator? This sounds kind of ridiculous. Unfortunately, it was for his, his teenage son. And then, so Sean and I got to talking about, hey, when's the last time we bought a graphing calculator? Uh, and you know, how the world was different then. And we kind of talked to both being database guys. We started talking about, hey, how do we create applications back in the day? And I know the last time I bought a graphing calculator was in 1999. I was a sophomore in high school. And at that point, if I was going to create an application then, I would have created the LAMP stack, and I would have put everything in the M, regardless of its shape, form, function, fit, purpose. Uh, and I would have made SQL queries work, because that's just what you did. 
Now, if I fast forward to if I fast forward to today, I have a lot more tools at my disposal, as Sean said. So what I want to do is I want to walk through an application that we've built, and we've really taken this calculator, uh, you know, this calculator theme to heart because of the laws of supply and demand have been very good to calculators. Turns out they're the same cost today as they were uh, back when I bought one in 1999, so we figured it'd be a good business to get into. So we've created a demo architecture, and what we're going to show is how to build uh, a purpose-built application using the tools at our disposal. So we're going to use Dynamo for one function, what it's very good at. We're going to use Amazon Neptune, a new graph database for what it's very good at. Uh, and we're also going to use uh, Amazon Elasticsearch service. So let me switch over. Back on track. So we created a calculator website. Um, and when you start building a website like this, one of the really great experiences, or one of the first experiences you think about is, I want to enable customers to purchase calculators because that's the business that I'm in. So when we think about this experience, we think about a product catalog, you know, we're going to display calculators, we're going to want to have this concept of a shopping cart, uh, we're going to want to be able to process orders, right? We want customers uh, to be able to purchase things, uh, record that in a very durable, uh, available way, uh, so that we can be able to charge them and make money for our business. Now, the database I want to use for this particular set of tables, my products, orders, and shopping cart, is DynamoDB. Why do I want to use that? Well, we heard a really great story about Expedia this morning in Andy's keynote. The other reason is I went around and I looked at, you know, what are the other big e-commerce websites using DynamoDB to power their shopping cart uh, experience, and Amazon is one of them as well. Now, on Prime Day this year in 2017, uh, Dynamo did over three trillion requests uh, during that time period and maxed out at over 12.9 million requests per second. So if it's good enough for Dynamo to be, uh, I think it's certainly good enough for my, my fledging calculator business. Um, the other reason I really like DynamoDB is two reasons. It's serverless, so I'm not picking instance types, and it auto scales. So I don't have to choose how much throughput at the beginning when I'm creating my table. Uh, it'll adjust automatically for me as my workload varies. So let me go into the DynamoDB console um, and let me create a DynamoDB table. Now, for the purposes of this, I've already you know, pre-created the turkey for our calculator website, but let me show you how, uh, how this was created. So we'll call this table live, live product demo. We'll simulate our product ID. Uh, and then we're off to the races. All right. Now, so now I have my product. I, I have my product table. I have my orders table, and I have my my users table. Now, if I go back to my website, the next experience I really want to light up for my customers is I want to have a really great search experience. Right. I want customers to be able to find the, the find the products that I'm selling, and I want to be able to account for customers perhaps misspelling things. Um, not knowing exactly what they're looking for. I think we can all attest we've been to websites before, the search experience hasn't been great, uh, and, and it really sours us, so we want to make sure our customers have a really great user experience. Now, I can build this experience in a number of different databases. I could try to write the SQL to do all this fuzzing logic and handle capitalization and misspellings, um, or I could use the Amazon Elastic Search service, which is purpose-built to do full-text queries. So it enables me to say, like, hey, for the AI, uh, for the AI series of calculators, I'll just say AI. Perhaps, you know, I heard from a friend that it's AI 9 is the calculator to have. Um, and I can use that to do a very intuitive search so I can bring that back to my customers, uh, even if they don't spell it perfectly. Right? So, you know, so now I got my, my website wired up with Elasticsearch. Now, what we've kind of noticed now is now we have two different purpose-built data stores that are powering our website. We have our products table that's sitting in DynamoDB, and now we have this index that's sitting in Elasticsearch. How do we keep these two tables uh, in sync and together? Because I don't want customers to be able to search for a product that doesn't exist. And I don't want to have product in my product table in DynamoDB that customers can't search for because that's going to be a lost business opportunity. So one of the really um, cool features and what really enables us to do this uh, is, is Lambda and triggers. And DynamoDB has a feature called streams that makes this very easy. Now, streams is a feature in DynamoDB that is a change log for all the actions that get performed uh, when I manipulate items on my table. So if I insert an item into my product table, if I update an item into my product table or delete it, it gets written to a queue, 
and I can use triggers and lambda to process that data. In this case, I want to add it to my Elasticsearch index. So let me show you how to do that. So first, I want to go into my DynamoDB table that we created. So let me go to uh, the one that we just created. And first, I'm going to enable streams. And that's it. Now it's enabled. Um, and the second thing I'm going to do, I've already created a Lambda function ahead of time. So let me just show you that code really quick. And what this code does is when an item is entered uh, into the stream and it hits a trigger, right, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna parse this record, we're gonna say, hey, is this event either an insert or a modify? And we can do the same thing for delete to remove the item from the record. And if it is, right, we're gonna write it to our Elasticsearch index. Right? And then now we don't have to provision any servers to do this. We don't have to have anything that sits there and pulls our DynamoDB table to see if there's a diff. This just happens all for us. So let's go back to our DynamoDB table and let's add this as a trigger. Right, so we'll go to triggers. We've already enabled streams, so we're gonna say, hey, I've already written this Lambda function uh, and I've tested ahead of time, so I'm gonna choose it. And I'm gonna choose a batch size of one. And what a batch size means here is after how many items in this, in this batch are we gonna wait till we take action? I want my website uh, to be updated for my customers immediately anytime any record is changed, so I'll create a batch size of one. Right? So now we have our two purpose-built data stores and now we have a way to keep them in sync without us doing any heavy lifting. Now, so we're doing pretty good now. We have a pretty good business. But as Sean talked about, we have a global customer base that we have to account for now. And we want our data to be uh, distributed across the globe for multiple reasons, but the two main ones we see from customers are locality of data to customers, right? So let's say we're gonna expand our calculator business to the UK now. Every time one of my customers from the UK wants to purchase something or go to my website, I don't want them to have to experience the leg of having to go all the way to a, a, a DynamoDB table in US West 2 in Oregon and then having you know, that, um, that packet traverse 5,000 miles across the globe to be able to refresh in their browser. I wanna have that data in the same region as them. Now, before today, replicating data across multiple regions in DynamoDB took work. Um, but with the recent announcement that Andy uh, Jassy uh, had this morning for DynamoDB, is we now have a feature called Global Tables. And Global Tables is the first fully managed, multi-master, um, multi-region uh, cloud database. And what this enables us to do, and like, I was listening very carefully to the words that Andy said in the keynote, he said with a, few clicks of the, with a few clicks of the mouse we can add global tables. And he wasn't kidding. Um, so what this, and I'll show us how to do this, um, it makes it really easy to create a multi-region, multi-master database. So then we can have uh, rights going into our table in, in Europe and having them show up in our product catalog in the US and vice versa. Uh, we don't have to deal with that synchronization anymore. So we'll go back to our table, and we'll enable global tables. So we'll go down here, and it's literally as simple as saying, add region, I'm gonna pick Ireland, and I'm gonna click continue. And now I've added global region, so Andy was, was spot on on that one. Now, with my calculator business, you know, now I have, because we've expanded to Europe, now I have a product team in Europe, and I want them to be able to procure calculators in Europe. Maybe there's some great calculator technology coming out of Europe, and I want my customers in the United States to be able to purchase those. Right, so let's, uh, so let's, uh, let's say that um, our European team has come across some calculators and uh, let's insert that data into our, now our global table in, uh, in Dublin. So we'll call this, I don't know, let's think of a new name, the Math 4500. That's the name of the calculator. Uh, and then the warehouse, um, we'll call it Westport, a uh, small town in Ireland. And we'll save there. And now let's insert this into our, our DynamoDB table. Okay, so. Uh, 
No, yeah. I'm not going back over. Uh, so what I want to be able to, so now that we've wired this up, and the, and the entire scenario now looks like this. We have a global table. We just wrote data into um, our region in US, or in EU West 1, which is the Dublin region. Because we enabled DynamoDB uh, global tables, that item's going to be replicated across to our table that we started with uh, in US West 2 in Oregon. Because we created a trigger with a Lambda function, we enabled DynamoDB streams, the second that item gets written to that table, it's gonna be picked up, written to our Elasticsearch index so that our customers can now search on our website. So let's go through that uh, experience and trace that uh, particular item through DynamoDB. So we'll go to our global table in Ireland. Right, and we'll use the table that we already created ahead of time. We'll look at our items, and there we can see on the bottom the math 4500 calculator is there. So we should expect if we go to the same table that is now in, in Oregon in US West 2. Right, we should go down, and now we see down here we see the math 4500 is there. We'll go to our trigger to make sure everything processed okay, so the last result turned out okay. We'll go back to our calculator store, we'll type in math, and there we can see the math 4500 um, available for, pur for purchase. So there we just created a global application for our customers. Uh, with multi-master rights, we enabled uh, both of our teams on both continents uh, to be able to write to this table. Now, one of the experience we might have glanced over when we first went through this purchase experience together um, and Sean touched on this a little bit, is this recommendation engine. And I think it's a very powerful thing now that we, you know, that we kind of actually come to expect with a lot of uh, the e-commerce websites that we go to. Um, but being a data guy, it's always kind of interesting to say, well, how do you actually build a feature like that for a customer? Well, you know, not too long ago, I would have probably made a 17-way join and you know, use recursive, um, you know, recursive CTEs to try to do this in a relational database. And, as my data size grows, that query is going to become increasingly slow. Um, but now with, that, with the launch of Amazon Neptune, I now have a purpose-built graph database engine to be able to write um, very intuitive queries to be able to create a recommendation engine. Now, I'm a very visual guy, so I've created, um, so I've created uh, a graph of what my social world would have looked like uh, when I last bought my calculator. Now in the graph world, these circles, these dots are nouns, these are vertexes, and they kind of you know, personify uh, an item. And then the lines that connect the, the different items are called edges, and they really define the relationship. So the, you know, the dark, do, dark blue dots uh, are people, and the relationship between them is, is nose. So I've ranked my friends by importance of to me uh, in that period of my life, and I've given them a weight. Um, we can also see they've bought items such as paper, AV cords, or they've attended classes such as biology and math. And from this, from this graph, we can answer really interesting questions. Now, um, now one of the interesting things about querying a graph database, which is different, um, which is different than relational key value or document, is what I'm gonna show you is Gremlin, which is a graph traversal language. And what a graph traversal language is, to me, is a very similar analogy is to, is very similar to walking through a map, right? We're gonna kind of walk through these vertexes, and then we're gonna use these ad edges to get to different places in the graph, and it provides a much more intuitive experience. Oops. Oh. So, I've created a number of queries that I wanna ask, and the first one from that social graph um, that I wanna ask is, who are the people that I know? So from this query, I'm gonna say, hey, I'm gonna start with me, I know I'm vertex one, and I wanna use an edge to say, who do I know, and then what are their names? Right, and now I can see my friends, I have, you know, Vin, Ted is in there, Jess, Ali, Matt, uh, and all my friends back in high school. But I really wanna know, when I make a recommendation, I really want those to be recommended based on the people that I like the most or that I think have the most influence on me. So I wanna order those now by, by their weight. Right, and we can get back a similar list. And the last thing I wanna do is, not only do I wanna know 
uh, what those people's relationship to me is, but I also want to know what are the items that they've purchased, right? So I can go back in and I can add that uh, to our query, and I can say, hey, now that we've gotten this far, we know, you know how to query for people that we know by their weight, um, I can say, hey, for those vertexes, for each of those particular people, I want to know the items they've bought, right? That's the edge. And then for those items, I want to know what the value of the name of that particular product is. Right, so I can go back in and I can query. Now, it's not particularly useful for my application because I look everything up on GUIDs. Um, the name isn't useful for me, but I actually want to know what the model is or the product ID. Um, and that's another property of my, my items. And now I can return this and I can use this in my website. Okay. So now we have a very powerful graph experience. Now, the last thing we want to do is we want to know what the quality of experience of our website is. Right? It's, you know, we want to make sure we have a really high quality um, you know, performance. We want to make sure that we know what our customers are doing so we can infer about their actions, um, as Andy talked about this morning with analytics. Now, one of the really cool features um, of Elasticsearch, and we haven't, or, sorry. So one of the really cool things with, uh, uh, with purpose-built databases is I want to be able to you know, query across a lot of unstructured data. And I could use a lot of different data stores to use this. Um, I've wired up my application um, to emit uh, Apache web logs. You know, perhaps every time someone clicks through a particular experience of putting something in their cart, maybe they abandoned it. Um, maybe they did something, you know, they removed it, they added it back. I want to know about that. I want to emit those logs to my data. Uh, I want to emit those logs to my application. I want to be able to process that. Now, the purpose-built data store I want to use for that, again, is the Amazon Elasticsearch service. Um, and now, being, you know, a, kind of a visual guy, one of the really cool features I actually like um, about this particular service is it comes with uh, a Kibana endpoint built into the service. Now, Kibana is a very popular way um, in Elasticsearch to visualize data. Right? So, you know, once I have kind of my semi-structured data in a, the Amazon Elasticsearch service, I want to be able to visualize it immediately so that I can start to see what's going on. I can start to create real-time dashboards. Um, and how many people in here are not in an organization that doesn't, you know, want to be data-driven and have real-time dashboards? Um, this makes it really easy to do that. Now, my fledging calculator business hasn't taken off the ground yet, so I've imported um, a little bit more meaningful uh, data set into, um, into Kibana, into my Elasticsearch index to kind of highlight the purpose. Now, from this, I can say, hey, you know, I have over the last 30 days, you know, I've had over a million users, a lot of you know, unique keyword searches. I can see how many bytes in and byte out are going uh, into my particular website on those days. I can look at the error codes, I can see you know, when, um, when I'm having 300s, 400s, 500s. Um, I can also look at his total request volume, um, access patterns to different pages. Um, and I can even see where the traffic is coming from. Uh, make a very easy way to visualize some of that semi-structured log data that we, we get a hold of. Okay. All right. This guy is still blinking red. Can we move over to the other presentation, please? Oh, it's there. Oh, just take a little while. Perfect. OK, so what we've shown you is uh, a multi-region application. We use DynamoDB uh, global tables to be able to replicate data across uh, the pond to our, to our other region in the United States. We use Lambda to be able to connect uh, our DynamoDB product table with the Amazon Elasticsearch service. And we use Neptune to provide a really powerful recommendation engine. Okay. So let me welcome Tony Petrosian up on stage to uh, discuss or tell you a little bit more about what's new with uh, the DynamoDB service. All right. Thanks, Joe. That was a great demo. And uh, hopefully, most of you saw the, uh, the DynamoDB elements in there. So I want to just a little, spend a little bit of the time talking about DynamoDB. As, uh, as you heard, DynamoDB is our uh, key value and document store um, for high-scale workloads. Uh, it gives you a performance in a single millisecond uh, response time range, regardless of your data size. It's fully managed, uh, so you just create a table and you go. Um, 
when you have large data sizes with unbounded size, you don't know what it's going to get to, and you need key value and need fast response, DynamoDB is a really a great choice uh, of a database uh, for those workloads. And the fact that it's fully managed makes it really easy. And developers have an array of uh, language SDKs to choose from. So if you're writing in, in Node or Java or whatever language that you choose from, uh, Dynamo uh, works pretty well for you. So we were here last year at reInvent, and uh, we, we caught all kinds of feedback from our customers. And so we took the feedback, went back uh, to our offices, and started working on it. And over the last 12 months, we've been doing a lot of work in Dynamo to meet some of the new requirements for our customers. So um, we, we've, we've done a lot of work in our um, adaptive capacity. Uh, so as I said, Dynamo is a fully managed uh, database, and so it manages capacity for you all the time. Um, you, you, know, you start using the table, and your throughput goes up, your application is doing work, DynamoDB can, can scale up, can scale down to meet the demands of your application. Um, so in um, June, we uh, introduced this thing called autoscale. Basically, you create a table, autoscale is on by default, and then you basically set it and forget it. And as the, the demands of your application goes up, Dynamo scales up. As the demands of the application comes down, Dynamo uh, scales down. So basically, you pay for what you really need uh, with respect of capacity, and you really don't have to spend too much time managing capacity. We also introduced this thing called Time to Live, which is a, a, a TTL um, where you can set expiry time for items in the database. So if you have tables that are infinitely growing and you get to a point where you think that you really don't need data from five years ago, you can set a, a, a TTL and data will automatically expire in the background for you so you can shrink your tables and, 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 and save on your storage costs. Or you can keep the data forever, um, your choice. We introduced VPC uh, so that you can include DynamoDB tables in your virtual private networks uh, for uh, better uh, security. And uh, as, as you may know, Dynamo is also integrates with uh, AWS AIM, so you can have fine-grained access control. So now with VPC and fine-grained access control, you get a very good uh, set of capabilities for managing uh, the security of your tables. Um, we also introduced DAX, which is the DynamoDB Accelerator. Uh, it's a caching mechanism. It's fully integrated into DynamoDB. And one of the nice things about it is it, you don't actually have to be fully aware that there is a, a cache sitting in front of the database because you basically point your uh, application to DAX, and all the writes go through the cache, and all the reads come from the cache. And with that, you can get microsecond response times uh, because it's an in-memory um, store for, for Dynamo. So if you need caching uh, to, to meet the demands of really high read rates, uh, DAX is really good for that. So that's the stuff that's already been uh, introduced over the last few months. And as you heard, uh, today we announced Global Tables. And again, this is in response to a lot of our customers who are building applications to, to interface with their customers. Many of our customers are, are building application with a global footprint. Uh, so as uh, Sean was talking about, somebody like uh, Expedia, I mean, their customers are all over the planet, so where do you serve them from? Uh, with global tables, it's really easy. As Joe showed, you can create a table, um, you can with a few clicks, you select the regions that you want to replicate to. And of course, this is really important because it's the regions of your choice. So you know, um, if you don't want the data to be in a particular region, you just don't choose that region. Um, and you can build applications for uh, if you have this globally dispersed user base uh, where everybody can read and write from where they are. And, and Dynamo is really, truly the, the first multi-master uh, uh, and multi-region database because your writes are done locally. They're not routed to some primary or some master someplace on the globe where then everything gets replicated from. We actually do reads and writes locally, and DynamoDB in the background will take care of all the replication back and forth. Um, you get low latency uh, for reads and writes, and in addition, if you really are the type that needs belts and suspenders for your disaster recovery, now you can globally replicate. So if you want to keep a copy of your data in a different uh, continent for safety and security, you can do that. 
with uh, global tables. Hopefully, you will give it a try and, uh, and give us some feedback um, uh, with your experience. Now, we also uh, introduced DynamoDB uh, Backup and Restore. Uh, we have on-demand backups now enabled. And the whole idea here is if, if you need to back up your tables for the purpose of long-term retention, if you need to keep things uh, for three years, five years, seven years, 10 years, for however long you want to keep them to meet your compliance and regulatory requirements, you can use on-demand backups. Basically, with a single click or a command or an API call, you can issue a backup command, and it, it's completed in a few seconds, regardless of your table size. Um, this, is, this is the first really NoSQL fully automated, fully managed backup and restore system out there. And the fact is when you click on that button to do the backup, you will not notice that there's a backup running on your table. You don't have to go and provision extra reads because there's a backup running. All of that happens in the background in the backend system. So your application is not impacted by the fact that there's a backup going on. And you don't have to go provision extra uh, resources because there's a backup going on. So you can actually go and click and make backups and keep them for as long as you want. Uh, and this is really uh, for, a, for a table that may be 200 terabytes and has tens of thousands of partition and you, you, know, you get a backup with a few seconds, you know, with one click. So um, we also, and that's available now, and we are also introducing a point in time restore. It will be available in early 2018. With point in time restore, if you choose to use it, basically we do the backups continuously for you, and we retain them for 35 days. And with point in time restore, it's for those conditions where you know, you're working on something and you accidentally deleted some rows and you're immediately like, oops, I didn't really mean to do that. So this is our oops recovery system. Uh, you'll be able to go back and restore the table to the point before you made a mistake. So let's say you made a mistake at 10 o'clock, you can go to 9.59 and restore the table and get the lost records back. Um, so uh, with, with the on-demand backups and, and, and point in time restore, I think we cover all of your backup and recovery and protection needs. Uh, we're also an announcing that we'll be uh, making uh, encryption at rest available soon. And with encryption at rest, all the data which is persisted will be encrypted uh, using your uh, service default KMS keys. Uh, you don't have to do any work. You don't have to manage anything. You don't have to change code. Uh, and with this, you can meet your compliance requirements and ability to meet some of the regulatory or um, uh, requirements for having data at rest encrypted. So that's some of the new stuff. Uh, hopefully, you will give it a try and, and give us feedback. And uh, now I'm going to ask Andy Gutman to come up and talk about more exciting things. Great, thank you. So how many of you are using Elasticsearch? Okay. A lot of Elasticsearch users here. OK, that's a great crowd. Uh, for those who don't know Elasticsearch, it's a distributed search and analytics engine. It's built on Apache Lucene. It's open source. It's very, very popular in the market. Um, you saw an example in Joseph's demo of using Elasticsearch for full text search, but there are a lot of additional use cases people are using Elasticsearch for. First of all, it's very, very popular for application monitoring, both at the infrastructure and application level. Uh, we see a lot of use uh, in security event management. IoT is using a lot of Elasticsearch. Um, and then also for clickstream and business analytics, uh, we're seeing Elasticsearch being used very, very commonly. What really distinguishes Elasticsearch is the fact that it's real-time analytics. So as opposed to doing batch analytics and waiting for a few minutes or for you know, a few seconds, uh, you can basically take a huge amount of data, terabytes of data, use Kibana, which is the visualization layer that Joseph showed you, and analyze and drill down into your data basically in real time. Uh, so very, very productive. Amazon Elasticsearch Service is our fully managed service for open source Elasticsearch. Uh, really, the key focus areas for us have been to make this super easy to use. Setting up Elasticsearch at scale is hard. It's really not something you want to be doing on your own. Uh, we make it easy at the click of the button to set up a pretty complex to uh, topology. It could be three masters, 47 you know, data instances, and we just do it like that. And if you want it in multi-AZ, uh, we'll do that for you also. 
In addition, it was really important for us to deliver an open and integrated experience. So we really try to make sure that we expose all the open APIs of Elasticsearch so you can use all the same tools and applications that you've been using on-premise or in your self-managed Elasticsearch environment. We give you uh, access to Kibana, and so we host Kibana for you. And then we've also tried to really integrate it into the AWS experience. So we've integrated it with IAM, with CloudWatch Logs, with Kinesis Firehose, with IoT, um, to really give you that kind of AWS embedded experience. Security is a super important aspect of this service. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about security in the next slide, but we have a very rich roadmap to make sure that we both help you on security and compliance with this service. And last but not least, Elasticsearch is about analytics at scale. So we're just continuously pushing the envelope of scale with this service. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And then also making sure that it's always available. Um, and today we host that in two, we can host the Elasticsearch in two AZs for you. So this year has been a really exciting year for us. Um, in January, we started with the release of Elasticsearch 5. We've actually had two additional minor releases of, of Elasticsearch 5 since then. We try and make sure that we deliver a lot of choice to you uh, as part of this service. So we launched uh, support for C4s, M4s, and R4s earlier this year. We also increased the per node storage to one and a half terabytes. And in April, we really started to push the envelope on scale, moving from about 30 terabyte max to 150 terabytes and 100 nodes uh, under management. And then a very you know, long requested feature, and I know it took a bit longer than most of you wanted, uh, we launched VPC support in October, and also we exposed slow logs through CloudWatch logs, so if you have queries that are taking too much time, you can actually see that consolidated, even if you have 100 nodes, everything gets consolidated in CloudWatch logs. December is going to be a really big month for Elasticsearch service. We have three big releases coming out, and so I'll give you a, a small preview of those releases. Uh, we intend to take another step function in scale, uh, so we'll be uh, launching support for over one petabyte uh, per domain in Elasticsearch. We're going to be using i3 instances for that. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with i3 instances, they're pretty much like our R4s, but they have really cool NVMe SSD drives. They give you 3.3 million IOPS, 16 gigabytes per second. Actually, the, the drives are faster than Elasticsearch, so you'll get about three times better performance, but Elasticsearch today can't even push those, uh, those machines, and so that's gonna be coming up pretty soon. Uh, we're finally launching encryption at rest, and that's also gonna be supporting uh, KMS, so you'll be able to manage your own keys uh, and, and use that on Elasticsearch. And then Elasticsearch 6, which was just released, I think, two to three weeks ago, is also plan to launch uh, this mo uh, next month. Um, for those of you who've been on the service for quite some time, you probably saw that you know, in the early days of the service, it took us some time to you know, stay up to date with the recent versions of Elasticsearch. That has really been a key focus area for us. And as you can see, our goal now is really to deliver those within a few weeks. We don't wanna, we don't wanna deliver new versions too quickly because we have to make sure that they're stable, they're, we put them through security tests, and we really give you hardened binaries. Elastic Cache, another really awesome service. Elastic Cache is all about performance and in-memory uh, in memory database. It started as a cache with Memcached, then we added support for Redis. But really, Redis today is being used for a lot of use cases beyond just caching. Uh, we, see, we see Redis being used for leaderboards, for PubSub. Um, if, you, if you want to do any API throttling, usually you'll be using Redis because of its great performance. Um, the latencies you typically get here are in the hundreds of microseconds, so you really get amazing latencies uh, with the service. So, you know, I intentionally call this ex extreme performance and not performance like we say in most of our AWS sites because Elastic Cash is really about taking performance um, as far as we can. Um, this is a secure and hardened service, very scalable and highly available. We do multi-AZ, uh, we have replication in Redis, um, so even though it's in memory, we can replicate and we can make sure you have failover across AZs if something goes wrong. So very good, proven, resilient service. Uh, the team has had a really awesome um, roadmap this year. Uh, towards the end of last year, we launched support for Redis Cluster. Redis Cluster is a sharded, um, is sharding support for Redis. And basically this year, 
we've added additional features on top of that Redis cluster support. So in March, we added support for backup restore. But this isn't just a simple backup and restore. If you shard in one way, you take a backup, and now you have a whole new topology, and you're sharding in a different way, and you do a restore. We have a smart restore, and we actually reshard the data, and it just works. You don't have to think about it. We added a new version of Memcache. Um, a feature a lot of you asked us for is, you know, how do we know that this multi-AZ actually works? Like, our application is mission critical. You know, we serve a lot of gaming and ad tech with this service. So this is truly a mission critical service for them. Um, so we added a really cool feature where you can actually test failover. You can make the machine fail. We fail over to multi-AZ. And you can actually make sure that, you know, we stay true to our promise on our failover guarantees. Um, new, some new features we just released. Uh, we released uh, encryption address and encryption in transit uh, for Redis. Uh, as part of that, we also finally added support for the Redis auth command, which we've been asked for for quite some time. Uh, now we've also been able to get HIPAA, uh, this, the service will basically enable you to get HIPAA certified. Um, and probably the coolest of them all is we now have online cluster resizing. So if you know you have a peak, for example, if our calculator business, you know, really takes off and we know we have a peak, um, yeah, I know it's Christmas sales, we can basically um, scale up our cluster. We will re resize and reshard that uh, as the peak happens and it's seamless. So there's no downtime when it happens. But more interesting, you know, after the holidays are over, you want to start saving money. Uh, scaling down is always the problem. So what we've done here is as long as you have enough memory, the scaling down actually works and you don't have to worry about it. So you can scale up, you can scale down. Uh, really cool feature. So we talked quite a bit about highly connected data. Um, I think the most important thing here is there's a lot of unlocked value in how data connects. And most data stores today focus on the data versus on the connectivity of the data. So they're critically important, but they're just certain things that are very hard to do. And so if you think about use cases like recommendation engines, like fraud detection, social networking, knowledge graphs, um, they're just a bunch of really, really interesting um, use cases. Security, to, you know, IT topology management and security intrusion, it's all about connections and how people behave or don't behave in the same way. You know, are people coming in from the same IP address with different login, uh, logins, you know, taking, taking the same action, maybe there's some fraud there. Um, the real challenge we've seen, and Andy talked about this in the keynote today, is that most graph applications today are actually built on relational databases. Um, and I'll talk in a second why they're not built on graph databases to date, but um, they've been built on relational databases, and that just, it doesn't work, it doesn't scale. Uh, graphs usually, they evolve, the schema evolves, and it actually doesn't even have schema in most cases. And going into a rigid schema database like relational database is just too hard. You'd have to change it all the time and create a lot of unnatural foreign keys. Uh, querying graph data in a relational database is too complicated. You end up doing a lot of joins, it's really hard. And if you saw, you know, in the demo you saw that you know, we could just query our graph with like one line and, it, and everything is very natural. It's a fluid interface, it's really natural, you're traversing the graph and you're thinking as a graph. And then last but not least, uh, relational isn't built for graph processing, so it's great at other things, but if you try and run graph queries, most probably your query is actually gonna run pretty slow. And so why didn't we go and do, you know, an RDS for some existing graph database that's already out there? You know, we looked at the graph databases and what we found was, you know, they were either too expensive, they didn't have the enterprise capabilities that customer needed. Graph tends to be mission critical uh, for, bi for businesses already depending on graph. Um, and we also felt that most graph databases kind of force you into certain graph choice. And we wanted to make sure that we really embrace open, uh, open APIs and we give you choice of more than one graph model. And so today in the keynote, we, in Andy's keynote, we announced the availability of Amazon Neptune. It's a fast, reliable graph database. Uh, it's built to store billions of relationships. So really, you know, you, this thing can scale to a very high level. Um, it is 
it is engineered for interactive uh, experiences. So, um, so you can basically query it with milliseconds latency. We take six replicas of your data, so it's extremely durable and reliable. Um, those re that replica data is in three AZs, and so if a full you know data center or AZ goes out, uh, your graph data is durable and is still running. It's super easy to use. Uh, we've intentionally embraced, as I said, open APIs, which means you can find a lot of content out there. You can find examples, um, and the you know the two models we embraced are. Apache Tinkerpop, which is part of the Apache Software Foundation. It's an open source framework. Uh, and that is a, the, a property graph model for those of you who know graph. And the second uh, query language that we embraced is Sparkle, which is part of the W3C semantic web. So that's an open standard. And so anything that supports RDF Sparkle uh, will actually work with Amazon Neptune. So I have Sean come back up here. And he's going to talk about some of the sessions on non-relational, but I want to thank you for coming. All right, thanks, Andy. <laughs> All right. Um, so that's, uh, I'll leave this up here. I just, I think we have two slides. Yeah, two. I'll let you take a picture of these. Um, one thing I wanted to know is Neptu Neptune um, was under uh, embargo. So because it was announced today, you didn't see these Neptune sessions leading up to reInvent. So I'd point out there's Neptune sessions. If you're excited about Graph, you want to learn more um, uh, throughout the rest of the week, uh, there's uh, different sessions to go into more details. Um, and the same is true for Dynamo, Elasticache, Elasticsearch, et cetera. So I'd kind of leave you with this thought. Um, my hunch is, is that, uh, uh, that the application characteristics of these cloud applications you know, in terms of having millions of users and lots of data, things being globally distributed. Um, I think that's here to last. Uh, milliseconds and microseconds is really becoming a new norm. And what I hear from people over and over and over is, you know, most developers are not wanting to trade off scalability, performance, or programmability for the convenience of a one-size-fits-all. And what that really means is when you see something like graph, um, you're probably going to want to take the full benefit of that programming surface and then enjoy all the scale and perf that comes with it. And I think that's going to hold true for a number of choices that you might make. Um, I know sometimes um, when you take a step back and you start to think of a certain use case, uh, you know, you might have two or three choices between a variety of building blocks. I think that's software in general. Uh, but kind of going back to the beginning of this talk, uh, the one thing that I've seen uh, hold true and be quite successful is just, I'd always remind you, think about really what is the purpose uh, uh, um, of a particular database where I don't have to trade off programmability scale and performance and you know, how can it help me solve a particular problem. And odds are you'll end up using a variety of these fully managed APIs uh, to build these new types of apps. Um, and then, uh, so with that, we appreciate everybody's time. I think we're, there's like 25 seconds here, so we, we actually did make it on time. But if anybody has any questions, come on up and join us up here at the front and uh, enjoy the rest of your reInvent. Thank you. I don't, I don't think I've ever been that accurate.